Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Justin Gillis, Dr. Peter Glick, Dr. Salman Hussein, Kathleen Merrigan, Raj Patel. You not going there. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Justin Gillis. I write for the New York Times. I'm the lead writer on climate science for the paper. Uh, I also happen to have done, uh, both as an editor and reporter, a bunch of deep dives into global agriculture in my career there. Uh, which is how I wound up on stage today. Uh, we are running about a half hour behind with this panel. Most of you have probably noticed. I'm told that there is a dropout later in the program, and so we're going to catch you up. Uh, we're going to get you both a coffee break and lunch reasonably on time, I think. So uh, nobody, uh, nobody panic about the schedule. Um, I have a fabulous panel here today to help me tackle uh, the question, can we really do it? can we actually feed the world over these coming decades and over the course of this century uh, and, and do it without wrecking the planet in the process? Uh, there are full bios in your program, and so I'm just going to very briefly tell you who my panelists are. Dr. Peter Glick runs the Pacific Institute in California and is a world-recognized authority uh, on water. Uh, Salman Hussein works for uh, UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program, where he leads a project looking at um, ecosystems and, and uh, related subjects. Kathleen Merrigan was the, until uh, fairly recently, the number two person in the Department of Agriculture. Uh, I know her better as um, the lady who wrote the organic food law in the United States uh, quite some uh, years ago. Uh, and at the end, Raj Patel, most of you know, is sort of famous for writing a book called Stuffed and Starved. Uh, it's about uh, the sort of weird irony of the sort of billion of us who are sort of too fat and, uh, and need to lose weight versus the billion people who don't have uh, enough to eat. In the interest of time and uh, sort of do this differently than your normal panel discussion uh, happens, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to adopt a weird format this morning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask my panelists to pretend that they are king for a day, or in Kathleen's case, queen for a day. And, and the, the first question they're going to tackle is, uh, if you could fix one thing in the global food system, what would it be? Now let me, let me start with a little bit of a premise that might be controversial in this crowd, I don't know. Uh, we face tremendous headwinds in agriculture, including a rising population, rising demand for food, and as Michael outlined so eloquently this morning, uh, the, 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 the headwind of climate change, which is already uh, cutting potential output, and that's only going to intensify. I submit that the, what we call the conventional food system is not going to go away in the face of those headwinds. Uh, it is only going to get bigger. It's going to be under pressure to become more efficient. Uh, and so the real question, I think, is how do we improve that system? Uh, how do we improve its environmental performance? And how do we improve its human performance, its outcome for sort of ordinary people? There's a related, when we talk about the conventional food system, we're sort of talking about the West, essentially. As people have already uh, uh, noted at this conference, there's, a, there's another food system, the one that actually feeds the majority of people on the planet, which is the sort of smallholder food system. They interact in weird and not always good ways, those two systems. Uh, we need to worry about both of them and about their environmental and, and human performance. Uh, and so I've, I've said to my panelists, it's not off limits to talk about either or both, but they do only get, they only do get one magic wish as part of this uh, initial round of, of questions anyway. So let's start with Peter Glick. Peter, you're king for a day. You've got one chance to fix the global food system. What would you change about it? Okay. Um, well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for your patience uh, this morning. Uh, this has been a fascinating meeting already. I've had a chance to talk to some of you. I wish I could talk to all of you. Um, if I could do one thing, it would be to partly do what we're starting to do this morning that we didn't do yesterday, and that is uh, to figure out a way to stop thinking about the food system as a food system. The, the problem is that in the 20th century and in the 19th century, that's what we did. 
when in fact the food system is part of a water system and it's part of our climate system and it's part of our energy system. And we started to get that message a little bit this morning that the failure to integrate has been the cause of many of the challenges that we face today in sustainability. And that the only way to move towards sustainability, however you choose to define it, is to integrate. And I'll just give you one quick example. As, as carefully as the menu has been thought out and as carefully as this conference has been put together, I'm sitting here presented with a bottle, a glass bottle of potable water from Arkansas. Why? Food, water, climate, energy is all represented in a way in this disconnect. This, this idea that we have to move water around, the idea that a commercial brand of water is better than the potable water down the hill or in the tap, that our food system and our water systems and our climate systems are disconnected. So if I were to do one thing, I would integrate better. And we're starting to have that discussion now, and we can come back to some of that, but that's the message I would leave, and I'll stop there. Okay, Salman, you're king for a day. What are you gonna do? Thanks, um, I'm an environmental economist and I work for UNEP, so it's unsurprising I'm gonna say correct the market. Um, going back to kind of economics 101, even the most neoliberal economists will tell you that there is a market failure in the sense of what's called externalities, that's costs or benefits imposed by one agent on a third party agent. And agriculture is, is rife with externalities. And what those externalities mean in practice is, is the, the food we, that the, the price we pay for food isn't representative of the two, true cost of that food. Now there's huge heterogeneity across farming systems in terms of kind of biophysical conditions, ecological conditions, economic conditions, and social cultural conditions and norms that we've talked about this morning as well. But even give, given that heterogeneity, there's a commonality as well. Farming systems provide food, obviously, but they also rely on and also provide what we call ecosystem services, the benefits that um, we garner. For instance, leisure and recreation, cultural heritage. So what we need to look at is um, try to facilitate the market mechanism to be adjusted to represent and push forward the benefits in terms of positive externalities and to recognize the negative externalities. We've had a lot of discussion about the most well-known negative externality this morning in terms of climate change. Um, global greenhouse gases. We could also think about more localized effects, such as, for instance, leaching of soils, reduction of so the topsoils, and the effects that has on, on say, for instance, um, 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 aquatic systems. So I'll stop there, but I think what I would say is let's think in terms of trying to address these externalities. What we're doing in the T project is trying to address them, quantify them, and then try to, as far as possible, value them in monetary and non-monetary terms. So I'm hearing you say we need to get the prices right. We'll talk in a minute about how we actually do that. Um, Kathleen, you're queen for a day. What are you going to do? Well, first of all, I'd want to be king for the day. OK. I think Hillary's ready to be king. So um, <laughs> uh, my answer uh, is really about women, women and girls. Uh, you come to a sustainable ag meeting, you see more women in the audience than you do in typical ag meetings, but we're now a million women strong as principal farm operators in this country. You saw some strong women at the panel this morning. Um, when you think globally, uh, the Food Agriculture Organization, the United Nations, has put out a report a few years ago, and they said if women had the same access to education, resources, and leadership positions as men, world food production would increase by 30% which is the equivalent of feeding 150 million people. Huh. You may quibble with FAO's analysis and you might say, ah, oh, that data is soft. But even if you get somewhere into that magnitude, that's really unbelievable. And so my answer is really about women empowerment. It's tied to land tenure. It's um, meaningful in terms of lessening violence against women and ultimately goes to the big question a lot of the panelists have been grappling with over this meeting about feeding the world in 2050. If women have more power in their lives and access to the things that they need, 
we're also going to see a downward trend in population growth. This is really one of the more remarkable. One of the more remarkable things we've learned in the last 20 or 25 years is, is you don't need coercive uh, population policy at all to change the curve on population growth. All you really need is education for girls, and even really just a little bit of education seems to, seems to bend that curve uh, quite substantially. It turns out if you can read and write, um, you, don't, you, you wind up deciding not to have 10 or 12 children, um, um, maybe not surprisingly. Um, Raj, you're a king for a day. What are you going to do? Um, well, um, first of all, I'd abolish the monarchy. Just the whole idea of being king. It, well, I mean, it, uh, and I, it, Chai, it may not be that bad, actually. <laughs> <laughs> No, it would suck because it, it, it would mean that, that I would be officially the most powerful person in the room, and no one wants that. Um, but, but particularly, if we're going to solve problems of, uh, of agriculture, what we've, what we've heard and seen uh, today is that there's a, a plurality of ideas, and those ideas have to come from, from farmers themselves, from peasants, from farm workers, rather than from you know, the sort of science of knowledge in the academy or in big, big industry and, uh, and industrial agriculture. So. Um, what I do also, uh, sorry, Justin, is just take issue with the question because I don't think that uh, the industrial food system is is going to get bigger and solve things for us. I mean, I, th I think that given all the that. data we have, I didn't say that. Well, uh, I said it was going to get bigger. I didn't say it was going to solve. Things. Well, but, but I, I think also, it, given everything we've heard about the the the, the, the paucity of water, about the the ways in which uh, soil is already becoming salinated, for example, in the, in the bread basket of India, see, seeing uh, where the industrial revolu the, the agricultural green revolution has already been uh, sort of applied with force, imagining more of that, I think, is historically. Feeble. I, I, I think that, that actually, if, you know, if you imagine 25 years ago, we still had a Soviet Union. 25 years from now, who knows what, what there will be? And so that gets me to the, the, my, my, if I'm king for a day, just before I abolish the monarchy, uh, what, what I would do is abolish poverty. Uh, and I would turn for, for that, because I mean, if we're interested in creating markets for organic food, then the, the, clearly we're going to in, internalize the externalities. The price of food has to go up. We have to pay for the environmental services of good food production. But that means people's wages have to go up. Uh, and that, it, it seems to me that, that uh, we can turn to the great theorist of uh, the modern food system, Thomas Piketty, uh, whose uh, capital in the 21st century recommends a global maximum wage and a global minimum wage. And if we're interested in uh, making sure that everyone can afford food, if we're interested in uh, an economic uh, package that actually lifts women up disproportionately because women are disproportionately at the, the lowest end of the, with the wage spectrum, then a global minimum wage and a global maximum wage are the way to go. All right, those are some pretty big ideas. Um, We've got a big agenda here, and uh, 15 more minutes to sort of resolve it. So. <laughs> uh, who on my panel wants to react to something somebody else said, either to disagree vehemently or to sort of agree and stamp your foot and say that's really the way to go? Uh, let, let, me, let me respond. Um, I mean, let's put a question to Raj. One of the issues I think that we're, we're facing is even if you had the minimum wage, would it not be the case that you'd still have a momentum towards, say, for instance, more dairy and livestock production, which means we still have some of the issues that we've been talking about in the last day and a half. Oh, well, I, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I, I think the, the, the terms of Justin's question, we're only allowed one thing. And of course, the thing we're learning today is that if, if, if there's one thing you can do to change the world for the, for the better in the future, is there's not just one thing. It's, it's to unask that question. So I certainly think that there are structural reforms that we, you know, that, that we need as well. And, and in fact, I, I think Justin's going to ask you the question then, well, if we're going to in, internalize the externalities and, and remove some of the, the, the trends towards unsustainable agriculture that are already around us, how do you do that? And I'm, I'm wondering if, if I can back to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, one of the things, some, no, that's fine. I mean, some, some of the things we're looking at is actually trying to, trying to put a quantify and then, as I said, as far as we can, kind of value and evaluate the benefits and costs associated with different agricultural production systems. That's inherently an extremely difficult task. It means bringing together people from an anthropological domain, a sociological domain, uh, by a physical ecological domain, and an economics domain. And this is actually, I think, very much cutting edge work. But I think it's very important for us to do that because we have to, as, as Peter said, think about things in terms of a food system overall. 
and we have to think about that integration, but actually try to look at the value, value chain in different elements of the food system. A more direct answer is to say, for instance, you can find relatively simple solutions. We talked about carbon a lot. So carbon pricing is a relatively simple solution, although politically, of course, very difficult. And what that means is that we actually get around some of the issues in terms of trying to work out where in the system we actually have carbon usage. Um, so the story I, I have is, for instance, um, I was talking to a, a friend who's actually a, a Guardian writer in Scotland. I'm sure some people here probably know him. We're talking about buying some, um, some trout from a, from a local farmer's market. And I said to him, well, there was all kind of benefits to the farmer's market in terms of engagement with the, with the person you're selling, understanding the provenance. But in practice, that Scottish trout in Edinburgh has traveled 200 miles from the west coast of Scotland. And if that total 30, 30 kilograms of trout is split, we, we have actually got a huge carbon footprint. Mm. So sometimes we have unacknowledged, unintended effects that we can't actually allow, we can't understand in the system. Whereas in the conference, say, just get it right to start with, put a carbon price on things, and then the market will, in some senses, deal with the issue. Let me pick up on that. I was, uh, I'm a little surprised that none of my panelists went specifically after uh, the issue of meat, and so I want to raise uh, that as the, you know, maybe the single biggest uh, 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 issue we have. <laughs> I was in uh, Denmark recently and walked into a restaurant in Copenhagen. Uh, I'm not a vegetarian, by the way, but, but I was a little floored to be presented with a menu that listed, uh, this is in Copenhagen, one of the more environmentally conscious cities in the world, and I'm in a restaurant that lists sort of three or four varieties of prime Nebraska beef, you know, that was presumably going to be, you know, had been, you know, flown halfway around the world. And uh, uh, th this meat question, uh, I keep thinking about it as a reporter. We haven't done anything really ambitious uh, grappling with the greenhouse consequences, and maybe we need to. Uh, uh, the, 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 it seems to me that you know, we, we, have, we have rising demand, it, not just in the Western system either. I mean, we're seeing this now in, even in places where smallholder agriculture prevails. When people get a little bit of money, it seems one of the very first things they do is start eating meat or eating more meat than they used to. Uh, 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 governments, in the meantime, have been, I think, sort of uh, chicken about this, if I can use that word. Uh, <laughs> The, we seen, I see no government anywhere in the world that's really sort of pushing on this issue and sort of asking themselves, how can we, how can we suppress meat demand? How do we go after this? Uh, should we go after it? Why, let me ask my panel, why are governments so afraid of it? Uh, and, and, and what do we need to do? I mean, banning it seems like you're, you're probably not going to get very far politically with that. So what are, what are the alternatives? Do we need a global meat tax to go along with Raj's sort of global minimum wage? What are our, what are our options? Anybody? Everybody? Uh, they're deer in the headlights here. <laughs> well, no, well, banning meat? Uh, okay, so I'm just going to throw out something that's currently percolating that some people in the audience may be aware of. Uh, every five years, the federal government puts out dietary guidelines for Americans. The 2010, um, the, there's, the, this is the document that nutritional professionals use um, that helps inform SNAP program benefits, meals ready to eat, a lot of different things, uh, school meals. Um, and in 2010, the public-facing icon for the public to understand the dietary guidelines was my plate. We went from the food guide pyramid to my plate with a message being half a plate fruits and vegetables. Um, the next iteration is due in 2015 and the advisory committee for the secretaries of agriculture and HHS has been talking very much about sustainability. There's a subcommittee on sustainability. This is hot politics in Washington and around the country. And a lot of it converges on protein, particularly meat. Are there parallels? Is there a synergy there where your dietary guidance is about lessening meat consumption and your environmental needs is lessening meat consumption? Um, we don't know where that's going. On Friday, George Washington University, where I now work in collaboration with Tufts University, we're having a symposium on this issue. That's not mandating, it's not saying no meat, but it's about dietary guidance. But the other thing is, when you're a consumer and you're trying to shop, it can be confusing, case in point. I know a company where they get frozen beef trim from Australia, shipped to Utah, 
where it's thawed and then blended with ground meat. And at the end of the line in the processing plant, it's labeled as freshly ground. Well, that's true, but as a consumer buying that packaged hamburger, do you think it's beef trim <coughs> in part coming from the other side of the world? So it's also really hard. You may put out new dietary guidance. You may go to labeling, but it's, it's, um, it's a difficult terrain. Looks like Raj is eager to dive into that. And well, we'll uh, just in terms of when we think about the world wanting more meat as it gets richer, often that's presented as a natural sort of obviously people want meat. But the way people want meat is very unnatural. I mean, if you look at Samoa, for example, where uh, what one of the, the, the favorite food, what one of the favorite foods in Samoa is turkey tails, um, which is a euphemism for turkey sphincter, um, which has been exported by the United States. I mean, this is, a, this is the thing in the, uh, after the Second World War, uh, where it was exported. Uh, it wasn't fit for human consumption here, but it was exported to Samoa as a meat that people could get their teeth into. Uh, and uh, and it, it, it ended up being tremendously popular. Now, what, what, what's weird is that, that our desire for meat is, isn't something that's natural. It's something that's marketed to us. <coughs> your, your thought about dietary guidelines makes, makes me think about the Brazilian dietary guidelines that just came out. Uh, and they're very interesting. It's, you know, there are 10 of them, and the number one thing is cook meals at home, and the number 10 one is don't believe what food, the food industry adverts tell you. Uh, and uh, they're even going a step further and suggesting that what they need to do in order to protect children's rights is ban all marketing of food and everything else to children. Uh, and banning the marketing of food and, in fact, everything else to children ends up being a way in which you get to, to curb these, the, sort of, the desire for the kinds of bad meat that uh, are cheap and therefore for which a, a demand is then you know, significantly spurred. Uh, yeah, but if you're one of these, sorry, just one last. If you're one of these small meat producing entities and you have a diversified farm and you're doing all that proper nutrient recy you know, cycle, all that, you don't, you're not doing the rendering. You're not doing the kind of export of parts right. that Americans don't eat. And that's a part of what makes the system efficient and lowers the price. And I think some of the chefs are challenging us to think about using more of the animal and having less waste. And as had been said earlier in today's proceedings, we know that food waste is the largest um, user of our landfill. So, so I might challenge you a little on that about the parts. And I want the farmers who are in livestock ag to be prosperous. And so some of it is about sharing the wealth. Some of that meat and parts of that meat in other countries is not necessarily problematic. I think Peter had an answer. Yeah, I, I have to say this is the first panel I've ever been on where turkey sphincters have come up. <laughs> um, maybe not the last, though. <laughs> well, hopefully. Uh, but this is, this is an issue. So the issue of meat is a... It's a subset of this whole problem uh, of the intersection between science and sustainability and policy. Um, maybe it's about meat, maybe that's a piece of the puzzle. Um, understanding what, from a science perspective, what the implications of a meat diet or production of certain kinds of protein are for water demand or for energy demand or for land implications is part of the challenge. And if we decide that meat intensive production of certain kinds or meat intensive diets of certain kinds have implications for the global uh, environment or the global economy, then the policy question is what do we choose to do about it? Do we choose to deal with the advertising and the demand side of things? Do we work harder to internalize the externalities of, those, of the consequences of our agricultural decisions so that the prices go up? adequately enough so that demand goes down from an economic point of view. Do you regulate, do you ban meat? I, I, I'm not gonna go there, but do you regulate in some form or another to deal with the adverse consequences of, of our choices? We're, we're running into a situation worldwide that, that I describe as peak water. We're, we're running into absolute constraints on the amount of water in certain parts of the country that we have to do certain kinds of things. And if meat diets or meat production is, in, is water intensive, as it is, as we've heard, it's energy intensive and carbon intensive, then that has implications for our regional choices, for our land use choices. And we're not adequately integrating those things into, we're not adequately integrating the science of what we know or ought to know into the policy of what we do and ought to do. I think we want to say, take some questions from the audience before we're done. And uh, so if you're, if you're uh, burning with the questions, sort of go ahead and jump up now. Do we have uh, mics uh, floating around that we can get to people or? 
Um, it's hard to see out there. Yes, there are people know. behind you, too. Uh, it looks like we do have over here, and somebody here in the front row has a question, and then that person would be next in the sort of third row. Uh, building on Peter's recent comments there and, and some of the things that have been said at this conference earlier, um, Michael Pollan mentioned briefly a little bit about hope and good news, but didn't really elaborate too much on that. I, I'm wondering if the panel is willing to look at the large-scale intensive commercial production systems that have been the subject of much disparagement um, and recognize the progress that has been made in these areas of sustainability. For instance, the in, in University of Arkansas looked at the modern pork industry and can look back over the past 50 years, from 1959 to 2009, We've reduced our land area per unit of pork production by 78%. We've reduced our water consumption per unit of pork production by 41%. And we've reduced the carbon footprint of that unit of pork production by 35%. That's remarkable progress. And it's not unique to pork. You can find that in beef and poultry and, and row crop production as well. But there is no acknowledgment that I hear in this debate or this discussion about that tremendous strides and continuous improvement made by the commercial system, and what's your idea about the potential for future improvements from that large-scale commercial system? I think we get you, so somebody talk about yeah, that. Yeah, can I comment on that? I, I think that's a great question, and it, it's worth addressing. And I'm not going to address the, the big versus little issue, but it gives me the opportunity to say uh, there has been enormous success and progress in the agricultural sector in different forms, in different regions, in different sectors in moving towards sustainability. We've heard lots of pieces of that throughout the conference, and that's a good sign. Uh, we're producing much more food with much less water, for example. And in the panel this morning, uh, Bruce talked about the ability of subsurface drip to increase, to, to increase crop per drop. So I get the argument sometimes in California that efficiency doesn't really save any water uh, because uh, the, the, farm, the farmer just puts that water back to use. But he made the point that not only does it maybe keep water constant or cut water demand, but it increases yield. And what we really care about is not water use, but water use per unit food produced or dollars per, water, per, per unit water used. And there's been tremendous improvement. And learning from those success stories, I think, is a points the path toward the way we have to go. There was somebody in the third row that had a question, I think. Could we get the microphone back there? We are, we are at three and a half minutes left, so uh, we're gonna probably squeeze in one or two questions here, and then we'll be done, believe it or not. Yeah, my question is about the word efficiency, which has been used a lot this, this, during this conference, and it usually is used casually, like we have to be more efficient. I always say to my students, whenever you heard the word efficiency, assume job loss, uh, because efficiency has always meant the maximum Loss, lowest amount of labor for the largest amount of production. That's what efficiency in agriculture in the United States has meant. So I plead that everyone talk about what you were talking about. Is it water efficient, energy efficient? In what way is it efficient? Well, well very simply, when I mean efficiency, and I, my focus is water often, I mean doing what we want with fewer resources. But now, there are not, lots of definitions. That's not how the word is used. I don't think that's what was meant by a lot of people up here. Okay. Some farming um, of the future, Joan, as you probably know, may mean less labor, and maybe that's okay. I'm thinking particularly of the dairy industry and the survivability of some of the smaller scale farms in this region may really depend upon figuring out how we marshal government resources so we have milking robots, so people aren't tied to three milks, milkings or two milkings a day, and they can have other kinds of jobs. I think that we, in the big picture, are going to see a lot of different kinds of farming entities in the future. And some of them are going to be more, and some are going to be less labor intensive. There was a question over here on the end. Uh, can we get the microphone to wander over here? Um, where did the microphone go? OK. OK. Hi, my question is for Kathleen um, in regard to the new dietary guidelines. So I hope I'm not too off topic. But has there been any conversation with the uh, dairy recommendations? Because to my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong, cheese actually has a very high carbon footprint. Um, and I know that with the dietary guidelines, there's often this push for three servings a, a day for dairy, which actually uh, we don't necessarily need. There are many other ways to get calcium in your diet. I'm just curious if that's come up. 
Before, so that, before you answer that, th those guidelines, correct me if I'm wrong, still have to survive the assault from the National Corn Growers Association and, mm -hmm. and all the other lobbying that, that comes to bear on USDA, and they're not final yet. Is that, is that right? Or? No, the committee will make their final recommendations in January, and the responsibility for leading the process alternates every five years between the secretaries of HHS and USDA. This year it's HHS, so Secretary Matthews will be leading the charge to get them out at some point in 2015. The big issue around dairy is really revisiting our um, sort of mantra on skim milk and new research and questioning about the foundation, scientific foundations that led us to a no fat or a low fat uh, dairy recommendation. Um, but anyone who's interested about this debate, if you just Google Dietary Guidelines for Americans 2015, it will bring you to the HHS website where all the PowerPoint slides from the public meeting, all the public comments there, and a lot of the um, testimony is on video. So it's, it's a very open, transparent process. We have just used half an hour uh, minus eight seconds, so I think we're going to finish there. I think we're now going into a coffee break, if uh, somebody correct me if that's wrong, but I believe that's right. And uh, thank you all for your attention this morning. Thank mm -hmm. you.